Yamana Niani, come on, I got a guala, Hilalo. Colette has told us that uh, there is something like 6,000 languages spoken on Earth today. And very few of those languages have been properly studied. Um, there are very few languages for which we have grammars and dictionaries and detailed information. Most of them have never been recorded or written down. In fact, only about a third of the world's languages have writing. About 2,000 languages are written, but most of those have been written very recently because of the uh, introduction of writing through things like the Mayan system and so on that we saw. So about 4,000 of the world's languages have no written form. They are simply passed from generation to generation by mouth, orally, as languages. <laughs> So we were told by Colette that languages are under threat and many of them could disappear before they can be recorded from their last speakers. There are thousands of languages in the world which are in danger. This is an urgent task and uh, part of what we can do is to create collections of audiovisual records for the current generation, for people today, but also for the future. What I am going to ask is a question, what can we do about this situation? And what I want to suggest to you is we can do four things. We can document endangered languages while we can do this now. So we need things like the Fondation Chirac to provide support for this documentation. We can archive this material and make it available to the present generations and to preserve it for the future, another activity that could be supported. The third thing we can do is work together with communities to support languages that the communities want to develop and they want to see saved for uh, continuation. And finally, we can revitalize languages uh, so that they can operate in the modern world alongside large languages. What I'm going to do now is to very briefly show you how we do some of these activities, documenting, archiving, working together, and revitalizing. Language documentation, documenting the languages. Well, for over a hundred years, linguists and anthropologists have been recording disappearing languages for the future. And they've tried to use the very latest technology. Okay, so there you can see some technology from very early in the 20th century. Um, but you notice that it's very artificial. The person is sitting there being forced to speak his language and so on. By the 1970s, equipment became smaller. And here is a researcher in the Kalahari Desert working with the Khoisan people. But still, we intruded into people's lives, forcing them uh, to, to do what we wanted. Today, what we see is researchers going out to where the languages are spoken, living together with the people, and learning their languages with them, usually going and spending uh, three months, six months, living in communities, living with people, and learning and studying the languages, and also understanding the environment and the culture. The equipment that we use today is digital equipment. It's very small, it's very portable, and it's robust, and that gives us the ability to make very high quality stereo recordings that we can then archive. Sometimes the places that we have to go to to do this work are very far away from where we live. Um, I'll give you an example. My colleague, Frederike Lübke, who works with me in London, does her research in a small village in the countryside of Guinea. And this is the journey that she takes every time she wants to go to work on the language Yalonke, which is spoken there. So here is Guinea. She starts off in London, 
and she travels to Conakry, a distance of 4,800 more kilometers. Then that's in an aeroplane. Then she gets in a little bus and she travels from Conakry to Labe, which is 450 kilometers, 12 hours in a bus. Then to the, the little village where Yalonke is spoken, um, four hours in a taxi, a total of 26 hours traveling just to get to the place to do the research. So often we have to go for very distant places to live with the people to understand their language and culture in the context in which they live. In the modern world, we have globalization. This actually brings with us amazing opportunities. The movement of people through globalization means we can also record languages, not in the areas where they are spoken anymore, but in the large cities. There are many languages spoken in big cities that have never been studied before. And in fact, some of those languages come from areas that are very, very dangerous because of civil wars, because of uh, uh, problems, uh, for example, in Sudan, it's, uh, in southern Sudan, it is extremely difficult to do research there now. So the city of London has 400 languages that are spoken in the city of London. And many of them come from Africa and Asia, and many of them have never been recorded before. So we can go out to the, out our front door and work with speakers of endangered languages. The same is true in Montreal, in New York, in Cairo, even here in Paris, you have speakers of languages that are in need of research. Researchers now carrying out projects all around the world to document disappearing languages. I want to give you a couple of examples. The Volkswagen Foundation, which is based in Germany, supports research around the world, spending about two million euros each year to fund researchers in its project called Dokumentation bedruchte Sprachen. Here is a map that shows you where there are about 50 teams around the world working under the Volkswagen Foundation project. I am associated with a project based in London, the Hans Rousing Endangered Languages Project. This was set up with a, a donation from Elizabeth Rousing of 20 million pounds, approximately 30 million euros. And we distribute a million pounds in grants each year, supporting 120 projects all over the world in every continent, doing research, working together with communities to document their languages. If you're interested, I have left some material at the uh, exit as you go out. You can collect some of that. Today, there are two important features of our research. We work together in interdisciplinary teams, working together with biologists, with fish specialists, with botanists, with anthropologists, with language specialists, with computer specialists. Uh, we are not just linguists forcing people to sing into those funny machines. Secondly, there is close cooperation and direct involvement of the speech community. Today, language documentation requires active and collaborative work with community members, both to produce the language material and to work together with us as co-researchers, as collaborators in these projects. You'll hear some more about this kind of work from my colleagues later. So documentation can be used for all sorts of different um, purposes, for linguistic research, for oral literature, for anthropology, for education, and so on. The documentation record that we make today using our digital equipment and living with communities is a corpus of audio and video material. We use computers to transcribe it annotate it and to translate it into languages of wider communication. We collect data about the data, so-called metadata, which tells us who was speaking, when, where, what were they talking about, and who is allowed to listen to and use these stories, these conversations, these materials. 
the documentary record that we put together is the basis for doing practical work with communities, making dictionaries, creating literacy, producing school materials, and working with multimedia. This is the kind of research going on, as I said, around the world. Today, researchers are expected to archive their data, to put it in a digital archive to keep it safe. We have such an archive in London. There is another large archive that the Volkswagen Foundation supports, which is in the Netherlands. The archives make this material available through the internet, and if the speaker community agrees, then it will be distributed and people can use it and listen to it and make um, use of it. Today, we are seeing communities taking control of this whole process. For example, Balam Mateo Toledo, uh, on the left in the picture, has a PhD in linguistics from the University of Austin, Texas. He is a Mayan, he speaks a Mayan language, and he works together with the OCMA team from Guatemala. And we'll be hearing some more about OCMA from our colleague here who has come from Guatemala to be with us today. Another example is Ilter Panduro Guimac, a speaker of the Iquito language from Peru, who is a linguist, a trained linguist, working together with a team to document his own language. We solve practical problems working together with communities, developing writing systems and literacy, making school materials, books, dictionaries, and grammars. Here's an example, which is my student, Mary Raymond, working together with Kanai children in Papua New Guinea. The Kanai language had never been written before she studied it and worked together with them to develop a writing system. The final thing that we can do is work together to recover language and cultural heritage. And here I want to share with you a little story, a little personal story that I have been involved in. This is the language spoken in Australia called Gamalarai, the language that I began my presentation in. It involved a team effort between a linguist, myself, a school teacher who was also a linguist, John Jacon, and many local community members. What you will see is a language that was almost lost completely, but which we together have recovered and which is now being learnt and being used by children. Gamalarai is spoken in northern New South Wales in the grey area that you can see um, up on the top of the map. Let me give you a little brief history. In the 19th century, European settlers arrived in Australia and they took the land away from the Aboriginal people. They killed them, they drove them off the places where they were living, and they forced them to live on small settlements called missions. For the language, we have very poor quality materials that were collected by missionaries at the turn of the 20th century. By 1930s, an anthropologist visited the area and he writes in his diary that Gamalarai is the private language of old people. It's the language that's only used when very old people get together and they want to talk privately and discuss things that are happening. Otherwise, everybody is speaking English. In the 1950s, we got the first real linguistic research. Professor Wurm took some notes and a short tape recording from the very last fluent speaker of Gamlarai. Unfortunately, uh, this person, uh, Peter Long, passed away in 1956, and he was really the last speaker. In 1972, I went to the area and I looked to try and find people who might remember something about the language. Um, I should remind you that I was 20 at the time, so it's you know, not actually that old now. Okay, what I found was that there were people who could remember words and expressions that they heard their grandparents speaking. They themselves were not fluent speakers, but they knew words like mara, 
which means hand. Or one old lady told me, she used to listen to her grandmother. I'm hungry, where's my bread? So she could remember these expressions, but she wasn't able to use, uh, create new words or make up new expressions. In 1980, Corinne Williams found the last two speakers who were not completely fluent, but uh, who had a good knowledge of the language. And she recorded words, grammar, and lots of stories from these two men. Again, just in time, because they passed away within about three years. So in 1985, it looked like Gamlarai was a dead language. Nobody could speak it fluently. All they could remember was a few words, a few expressions they heard the old people speaking when they were growing up. But then, a few years later, something changed. Something in Australia changed the political climate. In 1988, Australia became 200 years old. We celebrated the bicentennial. And Australians started to think, what have we done in 200 years? How have we become what we are? What is our history and what is our past? And in 1992, our Prime Minister said this, we took the traditional lands and smashed the original way of life. We brought the diseases, the alcohol. We committed the murders. We took the children from their mothers. We practiced discrimination and exclusion. It was our ignorance and our prejudice. Finally, Australia accepted its dark history. And things changed. People became much more interested and keen about understanding this. In 1991, around this time, I produced a dictionary. We published hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies of the dictionary. Everybody wanted a copy. The dictionary was based on all that material that linguists had collected, all the documentation. We produced, with the agreement of the community, something that was very new at the time, an internet dictionary. When we discussed this with the community, shall we put your language on the internet? They thought, that is really cool. We really like that idea. The schools became interested. The community became energized. They started a revival movement. They put out little newsletters, like the one that you see here. They got approval from the government to teach the language in school. They organized some conferences and workshops and started to produce textbooks and books, new ways to use the language, and CDs. Back. Rock music in Gamalarai. <laughs> now you cannot get cooler than that. That is really cool. So the teenagers started getting interested. This is a great language. Those white people can't understand us. In <laughs> about five years ago, the state government introduced language programs into schools and provided funding and textbooks with te to produce teacher materials. Gamalarai started to be taught in schools five years ago. They ran some pilot programs, and what do we get? Those are five-year-old children. Any of you recognize the song? Manga mil maratina 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 manga mil maratina yunga yunga yunga. <laughs> so 
So the language came back to life. It was a language that was now used in kindergartens. Children were using, using it, learning to sing songs in this language, writing stories in this language. Here's a composition by a, a young child. What does it say? Yama, gang, I button. Buongiorno. No, I'd better do it in French, I suppose. Right. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Barin. And so on. So he's writing a little about himself in this language. Remember, it was supposed to be dead 20 years ago. It's now being used by children. Last, to, uh, in January 2004, the state government gave half a million dollars for the language programs. At Sydney University, teacher training courses began and a state curriculum was developed last year. This is what you can do working together as a community, as a team. So, in conclusion, researchers and communities can work together in new and exciting ways. We can document disappearing languages. We can archive language materials for the future. We can support groups who wish to develop their languages and keep their cultures alive if they want to. And finally, we can help to recover lost heritage and to revitalize languages and cultures for a new generation. This is the challenge for the Chirac Foundation. Thank you. <laughs>